Okay, no paper clips. I got cuddles in here, so you're not gonna meow, right? You don't need to caterwaul to get my attention, right? Here, play with this sock. All right, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, the manga by Akira Himakawa. You're still going to meow, aren't you? All right. So this manga came up uh, when I joined the Bunderdrome with uh, Tim Lim and Mark Pellegrini. And he actually remembered the exact same scene from this book that I did, which is uh, Link raising Volvagia. Please don't shoot the light socket. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be worried about this cat killing himself the entire video, aren't I? All right. So uh, I love this series. Uh, the last one I reviewed was... Uh, a Link to the Past, and I didn't like that one as, as much. I think it's one of uh, Akira Himakawa's weaker works. Uh, and maybe one of the reasons for that is I think they tried to cram too much. Like, they'll have montage sequences of, then he fought this boss, then he went to this temple, and he fought this boss, then he went to that temple, and he fought this boss. Do not chew my comic. Oh, worst behaved... He's a good cat, but he's kind of the worst behaved cat in comics Twitter right now. All right, so... Uh, the reason I'm thinking about this one is, well, of course, it's a good manga. It's also, like, an early work, so you can tell they're a lot rougher and rawer and younger in, in, in at this stage in their life than they are, like, decades later when they're working on Twilight Princess. I also think uh, The Legend of Zelda manga is an excellent example of not treating the original source material as a sacred cow. Like, if they just went scene from scene in the video game, this wouldn't be a good manga. Because there will, like, there are scenes where I'm saying, oh, that doesn't make sense, that doesn't fit with the video game, that didn't happen, but that's okay, because because they're reinterpreting it, they're focusing on making the comic have a cool effect on its own. And a lot of their scenes that kind of end up being interesting little vignettes uh, from the world that, uh, when you're a gamer, it kind of like, it, you almost want some of these things to be canon because they're such good ideas. Okay, so, uh, I've been thinking about George Alexopoulos, the creator of Problematic and uh, Mari Su, M-A-R-I Su. I think that's still on Indiegogo. And last time I had him on to talk about uh, Akira Kurosawa films, he mentioned kind of like this great distinction that some artists or writers are architects and some are gardeners. And the architect kind of like designs everything, you know, pencils it out, you know, it's like drafting on a drafting table. You get every line mathematically down. And the gardener lets plants grow, and he just goes and finds certain plants, and he weeds some of these, and he leaves and he leaves these in. Uh, and I, I have like a different angle on that thought, which is I think some uh, creative people are disciplined creative people, meaning they teach themselves how to be creative. They, uh, Even if they're not inspired, they can go into the studio and be creative because they know how to work, even if the muse isn't there. And some creative people are... Uh, muse driven. I'm thinking about this with Goya a lot, where his late painting was clearly like insane visions he he was having. Maybe maybe literally insanity, or maybe de demons were uh, uh, harassing poor poor Goya. But uh, I'm really interested in. A, I've noticed that a lot of the things I like have this kind of like spark of uh, genius to them, where it just sort of came into existence. Uh, Tolkien allegedly was reading a paper that was very boring, and in boredom he wrote, in a hole in the ground there lived a hobbit. And then that, well, what's a hobbit? And it, and sort of like the world almost kind of came into existence, and he didn't even know that it had anything to do with the big fantasy world he was working on because he was a nerd. Uh, J.K. Rowling has talked about how she was on the train, and the idea of Harry Potter just rolled into her head fully formed. Uh, Andrew Clavin has talked about how the plot for Another Kingdom came to him in an instant. You can listen to the whole audiobook on YouTube for free, and it's legal. Uh, so I guess my point is, sometimes genius, what, what we call genius, are actually insanely simple ideas. Like, it's stupid once you've heard the idea, how simple it is, but the difficult thing is you can't just sit down in a chair and boom, have the genius idea hit you. And I've been looking at my sketchbooks again, and this is one of the things I like about children's stories is they are not polished. They're not that logical. They have plot holes in them, but especially as kids maybe get, a, they're all very fun. Like they have like some very raw creativity to them. But I was looking at one by a girl who was about eight years old, and what kind of wigged me out about it is she told a cute little fairy tale story, you know, happily ever after. And then I asked her some questions about the characters, and she started telling another story. And I thought, okay, well, she's uh, just getting hyperactive, and this is going to be a new story, and won't have anything. No, 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 no. It it was a prequel to her first story, and everything tied it together at the end. And it 
blew my mind. So I'm actually going to like scan it and uh, record it and I'll share it with you guys because it's re what's really neat is she clearly just instantly came up with a two part story where the two parts fit together beautifully and like all the good guys become bad guys and all the bad guys became good guys. It was great. That, that was a spark of an idea just rushing out where I don't know if you could have planned that out uh, on purpose if you tried. It's just sort of like she was just going, going, going and it all came together. So that's what I think Akira got a phone call five minutes in. Hey, maybe I should actually open the comic book for this comic book review. So I love their rough sketches. And this is kind of a clear example of how early 90s their early work was. Like the eyes are bigger, the features are sharper, the hair is a little bit more, uh, what would it be? Kind of, kind of like a floppy anime boy hair. And I think they maybe moved in their later years to a slightly less big eye style, maybe a slight, slightly more representational in for the human form, less, less big heads. Uh, so like, as you read it, like if you can get past the, Hey, things are different than the video game, then a lot of their decisions make sense, right? Like Mallow or whatever his name is, the mean kid from the village. He basically just roasts you and he stands in your way until you get a sword and shield in the game. Well, that doesn't work. Let's ha let's send him on the adventure. Let's have him and Link uh, bond a little bit as they save the Deku tree. More, more of their cool little early sketches. Oh, did I mark anything else here? Da, da, da. No, okay. Going forward. Uh, okay, I marked this because I, I had a reason for marking all these pages. Really tried to stay focused. All right. Uh, I marked this because like the big goofy face on Link here. Uh, in their early work, they're showing a lot more inspiration from, I think, Osamu Tetsuka and uh, probably Akira. Uh, oh, what, what's the name of the author of Dragon Ball? Akira Toriyama. I brain farted there like the big goofy facial expressions and the little kid out of his element uh now because they're changing things what, one of the things i like about this is even if i don't like a change or if it i feel like oh it's missing something that kind of like calls attention to something in the video game that's interesting but maybe you didn't realize it, it was interesting because what this kind of brings attention to is like video game narratives, uh, you know, there are cut scenes, but I think the most interesting narrative aspect of video games is where you're just playing it, you're getting motivated, you're overcoming these challenges, and something is imparted to you, but it wasn't even like done using words, it was done using your actions. So when you approach Zelda for the first time, she hears your name and she says it to herself and it sounds familiar to her. Now why is that? Does she know your family from... Uh, when you were a child, uh, or is there maybe a mystical sense that she's aware of what's happening outside of time? Well, they don't do that scene, right? So the fact, that, even the fact that they don't do that cool little scene kind of hints that there's something interesting about that scene. But what they do do is they add additional details. They have Link meet Zelda. Good grief. You are the worst behaved cat. Now he's interested in it because he knows I'm interested in it. This is the laptop problem. Okay. <sighs> so they... The, the pattern they have is when there's kind of a blank slate problem, they try to like establish uh, a, a relationship or they just establish a desire for the character. And that's recurring throughout. So they have young Link meet young Princess Zelda. They have young Link actually take uh, Epona into uh, the volcano for the, for the second level. Epona wasn't there in the video game, but they want to have him form a relationship with Epona early, so it makes sense. Th this is one of my favorite things. This is like genius. So in the video game, Saria, your bestest buddy ever, gives you her, your, her ocarina, and you use that for the first part of the game. And then you get the ocarina of time, and it's just like Link throws away the ocarina. He doesn't care about, don't you dare take out my bookmarks. I've got to figure out a solution. I'm just going to have to start putting him in the garage or something so his meows are too far away to interrupt a video. All right, so the point is, like, in the game, that feels like a plot hole. It feels like, did you just get rid of that treasured heirloom? And then Akira Himakawa brilliantly come up with a reason for it, which is that Ganondorf mistakes uh, Saria's Ocarina for the Ocarina of Time. That's brilliant. Oh, golly. Why can't why can't you be like Luna Cuddles and just sit sit there like a good dog with a cute face? All right, uh, I like the. I, I'm gonna jump ahead. Another kind of like '90s style illustration. Uh, or, all right, this is this is funny. Okay, number one, I marked this because of this kind of panel here. I've noticed these a lot. These are transition panels. So this is the end of a scene, and it's sort of like a day passes or hours pass, and then it jumps to Link talking. If you didn't have this here, it would feel like they'd be saying. 
uh, we won. Hang in there, Skull Kid. Like, there, there'd be too quick a jump. Like, where's Skull Kid, right? By having this pause, we say, okay, time passes. They calm down. They go check on people. They realize Skull Kid is injured. Uh, I, I had to read this. So Skull Kid says he's lost. he was lost in the woods, and he said, Mama, Papa, nobody answered. Nobody came. It was so dark, and I was scared. That's why I thought if I made my face pitch black, I wouldn't be scared anymore. Justin Trudeau, Skull Kid confirmed. Okay. With that absolutely necessary topical gag out of the way. All right, I marked this page because the composition is really interesting and kind of complicated, but I let you in. I let you in here. Now shut up. You're not sitting out, you're not sitting two feet away from me outside anymore. All right, so you start it here and you go over here. Now, the problem is we've got these four panels over here and the temptation would be to come down here and read these. So. They put a couple roadblocks in your way to stop you going that way, and then they give you some guideposts to get back over here. So I'm going to show you this. The ocarina is in the foreground, right? So when you see something in the foreground, you pop and say, foreground, foreground, but it's pointing up, right? So if you want to go down here, arrow, 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 away, okay? And he's on the same plane as that in the foreground, so I guess we'll follow the arrow down here. Oh, look! Now it's back to right and left. So you, then you start reading right to left this way. Now even if you're stupid and you end up down here, there's an opening in this box here, which means it kind of lets you out back up to here, and then you're going to naturally be going down. His foot's going to point you in this direction. And it's all really nice. Now, here's the uh, crazy part, right? When you come back up, there's a tiny little opening with a dot for your eye to go through to enter here and then come down. I love that. So that, that's important, too. These open spaces where the panel stops is what's letting your eye get in and out of these different spots. Okay, that was dope. Uh, there are obviously like whole subplots they don't uh, touch on. Like th this is a cute little thing. Like in the game, you can cut grass to get rupees. So they, they turn that into a gag where Link's trying to learn to use his sword, but he's not so good at it yet. So that's something like where even like the tiny little details from the game, if it isn't worth a whole plot, it might at least be worth a gag. So uh, the this whole little plot is completely original to the manga. It uh, Mark Pellegrini remembered it as kind of moving. I actually, I remembered it, but I... Uh, one of the interesting things is when I remembered it, I thought, yeah, I didn't like that. They changed the video game. But then when I remembered it, and then I came back and read it, I really, really like this. They they just added an entire uh, like emotional beat to Link, that he's a sympathetic character, like he cares about animals. And then uh, this kind of reinforces like the tragedy of him losing his childhood, is they have this idea that what if he raised the dragon when it was a little baby, and then he fast forwards seven years, and the dragon's grown up, and it's controlled by Ganon, and he has to kill it which is like the wor worst thing in the world for a guy like him. So, yeah, it doesn't fit with the video game really. Good grief. Will I get... I can do it. I know I can do it. It doesn't fit with the video game plot, but it fits with the character, and so that's what makes it worse. And then they'll do, like, changes that I just like. Like, they decide that uh, Hyrule, the plains become a barren wasteland. Why didn't they do that in the games? Like, it's, it's like the opposite in the games. Where is he? I don't see him. Is he in my blind spot? I hear him, and it's like, oh, good grief. You scared me. I thought, I thought you were behind me. All right, so in the game, like, Child Link, you, you go across the plane, and the skeletons come out and attack you, and then Ganondorf came, come, takes over, and they disappear, right? Like, why doesn't it get more scary when Ganondorf takes over? Uh, another brilliant idea is they actually have Impa kind of be in a mentor relationship to Link. They explain that the earring he gets... Like, did the, te the sages give him a ear piercing while he was asleep? They explain that it's a coming of age thing, and it actually has cultural significance. Now, here's another uh, change where they lose something from the game, but they do something, in they're, they're, they're still doing it with purpose. So, in the game, you meet Dark Link at the Water Temple. I got stuck at the Water Temple for three years, and I went and played uh, Wind Waker before I ever finished Ocarina of Time. But at the Water Temple, uh, Dark Link is one of the most interesting parts of the level. Uh, and it it kind of works almost cin cinematically. You walk into this empty room with a reflecting pool of water and a tree, and you walk around, and you explore, and then you turn around, and he, he's suddenly just there, right? So he creeps you out, and then as you fight him, you realize he's copying all your moves, and you can't defeat him the way you normally defeat an enemy. So when you finally do find some tricks to, to beat him, you feel super smart, you feel like you've solved a tough riddle, and he toys with you a bit, like he plays with your ego before you before you beat him up. Uh, this loses kind of like that dramatic entrance for him where he almost like gets in your head a little bit. But what they realize is Dark Link is a villain who challenges Link and kind of forces him to be a man, to like kind of 
uh, come into his own as a swordsman. So they naturally combine that with a story about Impa training him to be a man and actually learn how to use a sword. It doesn't matter if the sword is magic. You've actually got to learn how to use it. So even though, like, when I've said, like, oh, they didn't do the cool scene in the water temple, like, they still get what the character, they get the narrative point of the character in the video game, and then they appropriately tie that in with what they're doing with their plot. I feel like Malon kind of got short shrift a little bit. I have a feeling Akira Himikawa don't ship uh, Malon and Link. Game theory. I've always thought that maybe uh, they might be. They might have hinted that Link married Malon because in a later game his descendant uh, is in a village uh, that's kind of like a horse village, and they have a, they have a horse there. Now that's not a definitive proof, but in my game theory, like the fact that Link's descendant lives in a region like Lon Lon Ranch with with horses, to me, like that implies that maybe the may, maybe the Link in this manga. Uh, married Malon, or maybe he died. We, we don't know. That That's part of the fun mystery aspect of it. So I marked this page because there's some corny dialogue, and I actually look, the cat is rubbing his face on the phone. This is a disaster! Nothing's right! Everything's wrong! All right, so the, the dialogue is kind of corny, but charming because they understand the core appeal of this series, and I don't know, it's the opposite of purposefully clowning the character or purposefully... Uh, being stupid because you think the story is stupid. If, if this was purposely being stupid because they think the story is stupid, they'd be like breaking the fourth wall and like calling attention to how dumb something it is. Instead, I'm, I think it's uh, unintentionally hilarious, but not in a condescending way, but just in a, this is so uh, wholesome, this is so pure, this is so sincerely meant, and maybe they're even kind of aware of that it's a little bit hokey, but uh, I, I think it lands. So I, I just read this in this weird voice. Life stinks. First, my mom died when I was a kid, so I grew up sweating and working to help my dad run the ranch. And now I've been kidnapped. But someday a prince on a white horse is sure to appear and rescue pitiful old me. Plomp. <laughs> Falls on his face right there. Yeah, so they're they're deliberately setting it up for a comedic beat. All right, so what's kind of corny about... Actually, I, the translators might be doing this too. She kind of has like a like farm girl, like uneducated tone to her. And it also kind of like brings home like what a very simple fairy tale kind of story this is. Poor girl. She lost her mom. She's in trouble. She needs a prince. Here's the prince. And he falls he falls on his face. And there's there's some more lines like that. Jumping ahead, and you know, like, it's a sweet thing, like, at first she thinks he's a loser, but then she starts wondering if he's her prince all along, right? So, uh, the, the joke is, like, Link falls on his face, he's, uh, he, he messes up, he doesn't quite look like a dashing prince come charging in on, on a white horse, but when you see him basically selflessly helping you out, you start to realize he has these great qualities, and he has this, the spiciness to it, yeah, and the girl's heart st starts going, but up, but up, but up. I also mark this because uh, they're just doing so much great stuff, condensing stuff, like Malon's Ranch, like that whole part of the game, that could be a chapter by itself, but they want to get like Sheik in, right? They want to get the Gyrodo in. So they add this whole subplot of uh, Sheik showing up and the Gyrodo attacking uh, the ranch, and that, that's kind of cool. They set it up nice by, call, they call attention to something. So they have Sheik dis disguise himself as Talon, right? And then later Link realizes, wait a second, so I wasn't talking Talon, and then Sheik's there. Boom! So if you missed it and you weren't paying attention, boom. You don't have to answer. I can see it in your eyes. Oh well, there goes my romance. <laughs> Moving on. All right, so then they call attention to things they came up with later. They had this whole subplot about Volvagia. They reference it later. Link, it hurts. Ah, oh, and you feel bad for the guy. Other neat little, like, plot hole things. Like, why do the uh, Gyarado not take away Link's weapons? Well, because they did take away Link's weapons, but Sheik... Uh, secretly got him one. There's like this super cool poster that was going around of like Sheik and Link fighting a whole bunch of skeletons. That, that doesn't happen in the game, but they kind of get to do that in the manga where they can actually make Sheik a character. Like all, all Sheik is in the game is kind of like a mysterious presence who helps you out and gives you some like cool songs to teleport around. And the, it's, he's a very interesting guy, but you don't really have a read on him. They also make Sheik mysterious in this, but uh, they make him more of a threat. Like, is he working for Ganondorf? Is he a friend or a foe? Uh, I, I, and I, I saw some video go around of like a video gamer who had never played Zelda before, draw, jaw drop when he found out uh, who the true identity of Sheik. But 
uh, that's something where the game has this great narrative impact and they just want to like lend a little extra to that so you feel it a little bit more so you kind of like are rooting for Sheik as a character. Another nice little sketch, figuring out. They mentioned that it's a Clydesdale, and uh, like I, I love that they even pay attention to the type of horse it is. Uh, they, they reference this uh, sketch a lot of Link uh, in, in this pose. I saw it once in the comic. It was obviously once in the bonus illustrations. I like that they take direct inspiration from the video game art itself to kind of start getting a feel for the character. Uh, I'm not going to read this, but uh, I, I, I learned that Roro actually inspired the Rito in the video game series. So, wow, the manga actually had an impact on the game. And I kind of like them being birds more than the Zora involving into birds. Like, that's a little weird. Like, fish to bird evolution? Like, just have a bird race, for, for crying out loud. All right. I want to read this afterward because the afterward is where they kind of, like, they're, they're, le they're laying bare their passion for this character and they're thinking about the series. So, this was like playing a video game for the first time. It's not even like we'd never played video games, but neither of us was very good at them. Even though we both played once in a while, we never felt any drive to play more often. Then one day in 1998, a TV commercial changed our lives. It was for The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. And they talk about how interested they were in the horse, and they went to get a Nintendo 64, and they felt like they were some kind of omen. And then the editor of Shoga uh, Shogaku Roku Nese asked them to do an Ocarina of Time man manga, and they laughed. It was like their premonition came true. Accepting that it was fate, we started to work. At first, we thought the manga might be best served by simply breaking the video game story into panels and turning those into exciting scenes. But that didn't go well at all. We began to realize that this job was more complicated than just retelling the same story. It needed more. First, we had to play the game, the whole game, before we could even start. That was pretty hard for us. But when we finally finished the game, we looked at each other and said, Video games are awesome! <laughs> Gamer girls, all right. For the first time, we understood completely how video games can be just as fun and just as interesting as manga. Both of them tell a story, but video games tell that story in a completely different way than manga do. Plus, you get completely caught up in the game. It's all, a, a lot of it's subtextual in the game. You're experiencing it. You're kind of like inferring this as you go, as, as you solve these challenges. That was important precisely because we were so deeply involved. We were able to relax, stop thinking like manga authors, and just enjoy the story. More than anything else, the world of the game was so beautiful. It radiated life and warmth, a kind of heat and human emotion that we'd never found in a cold digital world before. We thought about the fact that so many people worked for literally years to make the game, but here we were working on the manga, just the two of us. Suddenly it seemed like too big a job. We got a little freaked out, but discovering the true character of Link made us feel better, like a cool breeze on a summer day. Link isn't strikingly good looking. He j he's just mildly handsome, and for some reason, that seemed appealing. Now they do draw him kind of like in that cute anime boy style, but I do get the feel like they're not going for like the most handsome man on earth. Uh, he gets more, I thought he got more handsome and more pretty boy actually in the later games, but you can kind of tell they're going maybe for a little bit more of a handsome but slightly awkward teenager vibe, especially with the comedy. Uh, and it had been a long time since such a nice hero appeared in the manga world. It seems like there should be more of them, but there aren't. At first, we thought it would be easy to craft such a hero, so we had no excuse for failure. But it turned out to be quite difficult. So they're learning that pure characters can be appealing. Uh, but it's, it's, not, it's not that they're simplistic. It's that they're actually hard to write. It's hard to write a uh, purely good, very sympathetic type, type of hero and make them interesting as a protagonist, but it can be done. In the past, all the heroes we created were anti-heroes, which reflected our view of the world. If we made heroes too nice or too good, we thought they'd seem false and unbelievable. But the more time we spent in the world of Zelda, the more we realized that it had its own kind of reality. It, I was used to writing mysterious, conflicted characters like Sheik, but for the first time, I understood in the bottom of my heart that good guys could be cool, too. Link was cool. They're falling in love with the character, and as they understand the appeal of the character, they have to stay true to that appeal and improve themselves and broaden their perspective to make it work. And my partner always thought that attractive visuals could only come from tough, edgy settings. But Ocarina of Time has a different kind of attraction. The images from the video game breathe with life, incredibly soft, pure, noble, and well thought out. The polygons somehow reminded us of the stop-motion anime we used to love, but which never felt particularly real. And, 
and perfectly portrayed a sense of space, gestures, and timing. In general, we prefer games that are not too intensely cheesy or melodramatic. When we had our first meetings with Shigeru Miyamoto and the others doing this, the hard work on the Zelda games, we were excited, nervous, happy, and scared all at the same time. It was an incredible honor that they would entrust one of their important worlds to our hands. We also have to send unending thanks to our chief editor, who introduced us to this world and let us bring our own artistic vision to the project, and to everyone else at Shogaku Roku Nens Nensei Magazine. Thank you very much. In elementary school, we both read a lot of manga magazines, and we agreed that back then it felt like one year was much, a much longer time, span of time than it seems now. That's why we refused to cut any corners, treated this work with love, and put all our care and effort into bringing it to life. We hope that you readers who are even now on the cusp of adolescence, when the doors of sensibility are wide open, will feel the reliability of Legend of Zelda and, if even just a little, find some of Link's purity in yourselves. Akira Himakawa. Like, they know this is for a young audience, and they realize that a character like Link speaks something when the world is full of anti-heroes. Uh, I'm not going to read this. They just kind of like comment on how cool it is that these are finally coming out after uh, all these years, starting in 1999, and it's a good chance to come back and relive it. I'm going to comment on this. I don't like that they didn't include the uh, original covers in uh, the Legendary Edition, and I've, I looked online, and this is actually cropped art. There's a lot more to this illustration. Like, let the illustrator's art breathe, right? Like, this is this is a nicely designed graphic, but like, let me flip it and see the uh, original illustration on the inside. I guess, like, manga covers aren't as iconic a thing as covers are for Western comics, where, like, the comic book cover almost becomes, like, a big part of the comic book's history. Like, it gets referenced over and over again. But it would have been nice to include those few extra illustrations. Anyway, but uh, this is definitely a buy. Really worth uh, the good bang for the buck. I love the size. Excellent series. You're uh, good even for someone who hasn't played The Legend of Zelda. All right, that's it. Wow, the cat finally shut up. Good boy, Cuddles. You're a good cat, wherever you are. Now he's hot. He's right here. Come here, buddy. Say hi to everybody. All right. Number one Marmaduke fan. I love you guys. Like, comment, subscribe, and I will catch you later.